Hi everyone! Um, this is going to be the video for the May question and answer. I had some really good questions, so thank you for keep sending those in. And you can send them to me either via email um, on Facebook, so you can tag me in a question, or you can um, put them directly underneath these posts and I'll search through for them. So we're going to crack straight on, and the first one is ideas for high protein snacks. This is something that I also struggle with, but um, the first one is a good protein shake. Um, you can there's nothing, it's just a protein supplementation, so it's, it should be used to supplement your existing diet. But having a protein shake and a protein smoothie after a while can get a little tedious, and there's some things that you can do with protein powder that can make it a little bit more interesting. So you can make a great breakfast or a, a snack on the go with um, protein powder. And my favourite recipe at the moment, because it's literally just so quick, is one scoop of protein powder, one egg, or egg whites if you're trying to hold back on the fat. Um, but it's not much fat in one egg, so it depends if you're that bothered about it. Um, so one scoop of protein powder, one egg, um, half a teaspoon of baking, pow baking powder, um, and then you can put some stevia in there to taste to make it sweeter. You can put some vanilla in extract in there to make it sweeter, or cinnamon, depending on your taste buds. And then literally just mix it up and then you can either fry it off in some I don't know, coconut oil or vegetable oil. Fry it off in oil um, on, a, on a skillet and makes pancakes or if you've got a waffle maker, which I just bought one for like $15, brilliant, at Walmart, um, just put it in the waffle maker and then it makes like just perfect waffles. And they are a little dry because of the protein powder but you can add fruit or Greek yogurt. So the Greek yogurt on top would make it even more protein based. Um, and then the fruit can be a nice uh, source of carbs. So, um, and you can also with the waffles, you can cut them up, put them in a Tupperware box, and then take them to the yard with you. So that's what I tend to do. Um, Greek yogurt mixed with some protein powder is amazing. It's really good. Um, I also like to have. Um, so I I have been vegetarian for a very long time, and I just just have. There's no particular moral reason for it. Um, but I actually recently decided to include a meat-based diet just based on my personal preference, cooking for a lot, like I've got three meat eaters in the house and it was becoming a bit tedious to make multiple meals, so I've just started to do that. Um, but also, you know, if you're a meat eater, it doesn't mean you can't eat vegetarian sources of, of protein. So, you know, like um, vegetarian hot dogs or, or um, tempeh or tofu, um, can be like really good snacks with like so some tofu with a couple of chickpeas and some cucumber and tomatoes just mix it all up that can give you a good protein source um, and you can add hemp seeds chia seeds to salads to um, to with yogurt etc to make it a bit of high protein um, other things that you can do for protein snacks oh you can make like protein balls um, you can do that with protein powder and make almost like homemade crisp bars and there's like tons of recipes and I'm going to start to as as my I'm going to explain a bit later but as I get more time I'll start to post more and more recipes as I do them um, side note is that basically I'm submitting my PhD in two weeks and that's taking over my well my first draft in two weeks and it's taking over my life a little bit at the moment um, and so once that's completed and that chapter of my life is ended I'm going to have plenty more time to do lots of recipes, make lots more workouts and make the site plenty more interactive. So I hope that helps with some ideas. And if you want me to do like full days of eating, um, I can always just video what I'm eating and give you some ideas. I know that sounds really weird, but I actually get a lot of my ideas from other people. So, um, Is it that important to include unmounting training? Well, you're asking the wrong person here because I'm obviously going to say yes because it's my job. <laughs> but I think it is important to include unmounted training. I obviously think it is because I've decided to do an entire PhD based on it. Um, there's a load of reasons why you should do unmounted training. Um, one, because you're gonna perceive yourself to be an athlete. And if you, if you holistically treat yourself like an athlete, you start to actually have that athlete mentality, psychology, and I think it can create that winning edge, that winning drive in somebody. Um, also, from a symmetry point of view, I think it's fair to your horse that you work on your asymmetries off the horse so that the transmission of aids is clearer to, to your horse and that you're not fumbling about on top trying to work on yourself. Um, it's really important for like density of bone, particularly in women that are 
getting older, we lose bone density, and it has been evidenced um, in equestrians that we have quite a th high thigh muscle strength compared to bone density in these areas, and that's not a really good thing, particularly in a sport where the likelihood of falling off at some point is going to occur. Um, there's things like circle motion and stresses, so regardless of the fact that we might not be scared, um, horse riding is a risk-based sport and it's a concentrative-based sport, so your heart rate naturally goes up with the anxiety that comes from horse riding, and whether it's gone up because you're scared, anxious, whatever the reason, your heart rate still goes up and therefore your body still has to cope with it. So to offset any psycho-emotional strain, like there's lots of research out there that proves that athletes that participate in risk-based sports or concentrated sports like archery or like motorsports um, actually benefit from physical training because it counteracts the anxious physiological response. Um, something that I'm actually researching at the moment is, is the physiological demand of horse riding uh, because it's really complicated because we show really high heart rates and actually really moderate oxygen consumption. So actually, from a metabolic point of view, horse riding potentially isn't as difficult as it would appear from heart rate because what actually happens is heart rate elevates in a response to high blood pressure and that is in a response to lots of what we call quasi-isometric contractions. So isometric contractions that are held and then released and then held and then released and then held. And what happens is because they're the held, you get all the fatigue metabolites like pooling in the muscle. But then when you get the release, all the toxins flush away and then you have that, that tension again. So the blood pressure goes up and the heart rate goes up, but all the toxins get removed. And that's why, and this is something that, you know, it's not in one paper yet, but this is something that I'm researching at the moment, that why are we getting such high heart rate with such blo low blood lactate in riders? Because you would expect to see a higher oxygen consumption, a higher blood lactate um, with the high heart rate, and we're not, and that was, that was really odd. So that's... Um, yeah, you do, you do have to be fit and you do have to be fit enough to cope with the quasi-isometric demand and the only way you can get better at that is to train it but you can train it better off your horse because you can manipulate yourself in the gym better than you can on your horse because obviously when you're on your horse you've got to train it um, whereas when you're in the gym you can do a plank and then release and then plank and then release or you could do you know five hill sprints and then follow it with a plank release plank release hill sprints follow it because you're trying to get the heart rate mimic the heart rate response so there's lots of things that you can do off the horse that can can be sport specific like lots of jumping landing mechanics like practicing any breathing like um because we also think that some of the increased demand from horse riding might be as a response to like holding your breath so um, what else? Why would else would you want to include unmounted training? Um, I think that pretty much covers it. But in my mind, yes, it is important. Is is it the most important thing? No, because it's skill based. At the end of the day, this sport is skill based, and there's plenty of unfit people out there that are brilliant riders. So, do you need to be fit to ride? No. Is it going to help you? Yes. It's not going to. It's not going to hurt. <laughs> so I think if you can do it, you should do it. And from a general health and wellness perspective as well, you know, you, it's not just about how well you're riding. It's how long you can go on riding at that level for, because you know you're going to offset any future injuries with a good, healthy body. Um, when is Event Fit Phase Two being launched? Do you know? Like I've actually written Event Fit Phase Two. Um, I just need to get it. In a PDF form, and then there's a few, there's literally like five videos that I need to just um, record before I can go live. But like I said before, at the moment, I really need to just get this PhD in because once it's in, I can focus 100% on you guys, and everything will be about event fit. So I'm actually probably not even going to be considering it for a minimum of two weeks, if not a month, and then I will release it. Um, j just because I really need to just dedicate any time that I have to this PhD at the moment. So it's coming, I promise. And if there's anything that you're really interested in seeing in a programme, let me know um, and I will endeavour to sort that out. Um, I just bought a kettlebell. I'm really excited, but what should I do with it? Oh my goodness, I think I see a blog post coming on. I probably can't do justice in answering it right now, but I'll give you a few ideas and then I will note this down as a future blog post stroke video. Um, so yeah, your kettlebell's brilliant, very versatile. Things that I would do with it would be, okay, so a goblet squat with press. 
and I'll put these links, in fact I'll write it down so I can put these links, so Goblet Squat with Press, so you're going to hold, I'm just writing this down, Goblet Squat with Press, you're going to squat down, holding the kettlebell here, you're going to squat down, and then as you get to the bottom of your squat, you're going to pause, so that's your quasi isometric, excuse my isometric, and then move your hands forwards and then backwards and stand up and you're going to repeat that and that, that moving the kettlebell away from the body will really add tension to your core and you're going to fight to keep the weight on the back of the heels and not be dragged forward by the kettlebell. Um, you can do kettlebell swings, that's great for hip extension, great for shoulder stability, um, great for like trunk control, midline stabilisation. You could do, so that's kettlebell swings, uh, you could do like a single arm row, so you could sort of single arm row with the kettlebells because it's really difficult uh, riders typically weak all the way down the back of the body um, you could do a kettlebell clean and jerk and then down and kettlebell clean and jerk I'll put that here <laughs> um, you could do kettlebell, kettlebell snatch and the reason I'm saying all these is because these exercises, and I mean, in the short term, you can Google these exercises. I mean, there's got plenty of videos of these things, but I'll put some up as well. But a kettlebell snatch, it's that catch is going to do that isometric hold. So you can catch and, and brace. And when you do that brace, that's replicative of the same sort of brace that you would do when you're landing after a jump. So these things all, um, all like elicit the core, like core recruitment, core stability. Can't see my piece of paper. That's better. Um, Oh, there's so many exercises that you could do. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, like kettlebell upright rows, like this. Um, yeah, I'll think of some more, but there's like basically any exercise that you can do with a dumbbell, you can do with a kettlebell. And the fact that the weight is away from your body just makes it that little bit harder. Um, is it really, oh, this is, so I was talking in my last video about like proper hydration or adequate hydration. And I got the question, is it important to drink as much as suggested? So I suggested that I'm trying to drink four litres of water a day, which, or well, at the moment I've got like a sweetener in my drink. Um, so the recommended guidelines for females is between 2.2 to 2.7 litres of water a day. And that is just maintenance fluid level. And I don't know many people that actually do that at the best of times. And when you first start trying to increase your water intake, it's hard because you need to go to the toilet all the time. Um, but if you just keep going with it, eventually you do get used to it. And trust me, because I'm on now, I'm now up to five days. Um, and at first I was probably every 20 minutes, but now it's... <laughs> um, so the idea is that you need to drink between, let's say, two and three litres of water <coughs> per day. But when you exercise, you also need to put back in the body what you lost during exercise. So I probably lose between one to two litres of, of fluid during, because I do two sessions and I do a cardio-based session uh, five to six days a week, and then I do a weight-based session five days a week. So I then endeavour to replace that and then some. So four to five litres a day is pretty, I wouldn't say excessive because it's not excessive, but it's a lot. But I would be at least shooting for two to three litres of water a day. And I would make sure, so I used to binge drink, I don't mean alcohol, but I used to drink a lot in the gym or I'd suddenly get thirsty and then drink loads and you want to try and avoid that. So I would try and have like a bit less than this every hour, you know, so that you're drinking steadily throughout the day. And then I try and taper it off from now, which it's half five over here, so 6 p.m. so that I'm not up all night on the toilet. And, it, and it's difficult when you're on the yard um, and you're working with clients. I do appreciate that. Um, you just need to find a way to make it work for you <laughs> somehow. Okay, in your personal programs, are programs different for different disciplines? So the personal programming options that I I offer for you guys, it's a package, it's online programming and it is unlike any, I don't think any other questions at the moment, I could be wrong, but the what I wanted to do is create something that is completely unique, like I am with you, like I am your coach. Um, and it's um, completely dependent. So yes, yes, in in essence, it's going to be completely different depending on what discipline you do, and how, like, what your training history is. You know, whether your what your movement patterns are like currently, how long you've been training for, what your goals are. Because you might want to get fit to ride, but you also might have other goals like weight loss goals, or you might actually want to achieve a. You might say, well, I want to get better at riding, but reality is, I want a six pack. All right, let's get you a six pack. You know. Um, 
So the, the per- programs are just personal programming, and I just happen to be somebody that has done a lot of research and knows a fair bit about the demands of riding, and therefore I can incorporate that in. I mean, what you've got to remember about training is everyone's different philosophies are different like mine are very like back to basics types of training um really analyze the sport and try and replicate what you need to be functional at on the ground nothing too fancy and i like to progress right back to the basics and bring you forward um so yeah i mean for a dressage rider for example i mean just to, it, the program is going to completely depend on who you are as an athlete but for example if you're trying to get better at dressage then we need to work on the more consistent isometric control. We need to get you to be able to have effective posture about 170 beats per minute or 70 to 80 percent in maximal heart rate. Um, so we might use aerobic interference and sort of try and try and get you tired on purpose and then try and strengthen you up. Whereas with a show jump rider or a cross country rider, we need to get you to have quick hip flexion extension. Um, and you need to be able to control that far more rapidly than a dressage rider would be able to. And you will also have to cope with much higher heart rates, uh, blood lactates, and you'll also be able to have to be able to um, cope with like multiple landings. So you, in effect, you need to be able the isometric control that you need in dressage. You would need to. Um, it was it's more intermittent, so we would train that. You know, you do more jumps, jump landings, isometric jumps. So you like jump and then hold. And then jump and then hold. And there's lots of different things that we can do to like manipulate the um, demand. So yeah, it would be completely different. But I wouldn't get you jumping if you are somebody that is perhaps an older female that has shot knees, that hasn't exercised for 12 years and can't sit on the sofa without hurting themselves. That person isn't going to be doing jump squats immediately, but hopefully they will be within a year of consistent training. And the personal programs, you know, you can buy one month and then think, oh, I'm going to, you know, I shouldn't say this, but you could repeat the same thing for a couple of months and then come back and get another. Um, And, I mean, I like to switch up my programming every three to four weeks. I don't like doing the same thing for three months. But if you you don't mind doing the same thing for three months, then you can do the same. You know, 12 weeks is is a perfectly fine amount of time to do the same programme. It's just for me, I train so often that I would be completely out of my mind if I did the same thing for that long. Um, but yeah, personal programs are completely independent to you, completely independent to your goals. And it's like we sit down and do a bit of a consultation and work out what you want out of it. So thank you for listening to my question and answer um, video. Keep the questions coming in. I really enjoy like the interaction with you. Um, if you um, have anything that you want to ask, please post below, email me or put it on Facebook. And if you have any ideas for content that you want to see, let me know. Um, like I said before, I'm probably going to be a bit on the quiet side for the next month or so, um, and I'll just put up the bare bones, and then after that, once the PhD is submitted, I should be able to provide you with far more content, and I, and I will endeavour to do whatever it is that you guys need, because you're the ones that it's for, but if you want to see any, like, not day in a life, because my life, I'm not even around horses at the moment that often, so, um, but if you want to see what I'm eating, or ideas for eating, or you know, my gym routines, like they're not, they're going to be the same as your goals because I'm training a little differently to everybody else. But if you want um, some inspiration that way, then feel free to, to ask me for it and I can give it to you. So it's a very nice sunny evening. I'm going to go and cook some dinner and then I'm going to write some more PhD. So um, see you soon.